Byblos, Lebanon. Byblos is an ancient Phoenician city that is located in what is now Lebanon, near the Mediterranean Sea. It is currently called Jebel. In the ancient world, the city's specialty was the papyrus trade. From its name came the words Byblos, translated as papyrus, and Bible, translated as book. At present, Byblos is home to only 3,000 people. Most of them adhere to Catholic and Muslim religious views. The city is one of the main tourist centers of Lebanon. Byblos today is a modern town, on the territory of which along with the architecture of the 21st century harmoniously coexist ruins of the Temple of Helens, ancient Egyptian Temple of Obelisks, walled Old Harbor, tombs of ancient rulers and colorful Roman amphitheater. Byblos is an eternal city and the oldest. This is what many who have studied the history of this beautiful and at the same time unique city, where life has been boiling for more than seven millennia, say about it. It is located near the capital of Lebanon. By the way, this city is one of the oldest cities on earth, and people have never left it. The main part of Byblos is located on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. According to legends, the city was founded by fishermen, over time it became one of the largest trading ports. The city has been known since the 4th millennium BC. It was located on a well-protected hill near the sea, with two bays suitable for harbors, a fairly fertile valley around it, and mountains covered with dense forests behind the city. This hill had been inhabited since the early Neolithic period. But by the time the Phoenicians arrived, the population had left the place for some reason, so the aliens did not have to drive out the locals. Almost immediately after the settlement, the new inhabitants surrounded it with a wall. And a little later at the spring in the center they erected two temples to their most important deities, Baalatgabal and, apparently, Reshef. From this time we can speak of a genuine city. A strong wall, fortified by two towers guarding the two entrances to the city, from the land side and from the seaside, surrounded the city. From the center, where two temples were located near the spring, there were streets built with houses on stone foundations, some of them quite large. Inside some houses there were quite large rooms, the ceilings of which were supported by special wooden columns on a stone base, seven on each longitudinal side and one in the center of the room. Special drainage ditches were created in the center of the streets to keep the city relatively clean. All this testifies to the comparative prosperity of Byblos of the early period. Contacts with Ancient Egypt In the first half of the 3rd millennium BC Byblos becomes the most important center of contacts with Egypt. If before the appearance of Phoenicians in this place the main external contacts of the settlement were with Mesopotamia, the main partner of the Phoenician city becomes Egypt, for which Byblos was the main supplier of wood so valued in the Nile Valley. The earliest Egyptian object found at Byblos is a stone vase bearing the name of the last king of the Two Dynasty, Hasekimui, early XXVIII century BC. From then on, the names of Egyptian pharaohs occur in Byblos almost continuously until Piopi II, the last significant pharaoh of the Old Kingdom. To a large extent these were dedications made by Egyptian rulers to the sanctuary of Baalatgabal, the chief goddess of the city, whom the Egyptians identified with their Hathor as early as the 3rd millennium BC. For traveling to Byblos, and first of all for exporting timber from there, Egyptians built special sea ships, and later the name Byblos ship spread to all such ships regardless of the purpose of their voyage. The importance of the Byblos trade for Egypt was so high that when it was interrupted, Ipoer, among other grievous calamities that fell upon Egypt, complaining, says, no more people go north to Byblos today. What shall we do to obtain cedars for our mummies? From Byblos to the Nile Valley, wood, especially cedar and cypress, resin, perhaps also copper and lapis lazuli were traded. The Byblos received metals and lapis lazuli from their eastern neighbors and resold them to the Egyptians. From the Egyptians received papyrus, ceramic, and stone vessels, incense, jewelry, works of art. Some of the things received were sent further east. How far eastward Byblos trade ties extended is debatable. 
Egyptian products found in Ebla came there obviously through Byblos, although no direct indications of Ebla's connections with Byblos have been found yet. Therefore, it is quite possible that the Byblos traded only directly with their eastern neighbors in the Orant Valley, and from there Egyptian goods went further. Through the same intermediaries in the Orant Valley Byblos could receive lapis lazuli and other products brought from distant eastern countries. Be that as it may, in the 3rd millennium BC Byblos becomes a major trading center of the eastern Mediterranean. Destruction and the New City Temple of the Obelisk C. 1900 BC the decline of Egypt at the end of the Old Kingdom and during the first transitional period led to the severing of ties between Egypt and Byblos. Traces of contacts with the Nile Valley disappeared in Byblos. Apparently, this circumstance forced Byblos to reorient to the east. Now it is possible to speak with certainty about contacts of Byblos directly with Mesopotamia. The city is mentioned in Sumerian documents of the Three Dynasty of Ur. The matter, apparently, is not limited to trade ties. The kings of the three dynasty of Ur, following the example of the kings of Akkad, launched an active expansion, seeking to subjugate Syria and the Mediterranean coast, which they largely succeeded. The Byblos ruler Ibdadi bore the Sumerian title Ensi, and this, apparently, testifies to the political subordination of Byblos to the Ur kings, at least to Amar Sun. The end of the powerful Ur state was brought about by the Amorines, who began to occupy the agricultural areas of Syria and Mesopotamia. Byblos did not escape the Amorian invasion. Excavations in Byblos show that the early urban epoch of the history of the city ends with its terrible destruction. The fire layer covers almost the entire territory of the settlement. Among other buildings the temple of the Lady of Byblos perished. Soon a new town, middle town stage, appears here. At first the new town was apparently poorer than the previous one. Houses become more modest, one-room houses. The city wall probably disappears for some time. But on the whole, unlike many other places in Syria and Palestine, Byblos shows a clear continuity between the cultures of the previous era, early Bronze Age, or early urban stage, and the later one, middle Bronze Age, or middle urban stage. The reconstruction of temples is particularly important. Although they took on a slightly different appearance, they were reconstructed on the same site, dedicated to the same deities, and show clear signs of cultural continuity. Restoration of trade links. Late Bronze Age, 1600 to 1200 BC, terracotta vessel from Byblos, now in the Louvre. By the second millennium BC, the city again became the largest center of Phoenician maritime trade, its connections extending to the Aegean Sea. Timber was exported to Egypt from Byblos, as well as wine and olive oil, papyrus came from Egypt to Byblos in large quantities. The fact that the kings of Byblos used the Egyptian language as an official language shows how strong the Egyptian influence was here. Byblos is mentioned in the ancient Egyptian literary work The Tale of Sinai, Middle Kingdom, Eight. In the 18th century BC, the beginning of the 13th dynasty in Egypt, when Egyptian influence in the eastern Mediterranean was greatly diminished, the rulers of Byblos still remained only regional leaders, nomarchs, for Egypt, although they acted as kings in relation to other states. By the end of the second millennium BC, Byblos relations with Egypt actually become equal, from the Egyptian story The Travels of Anu Amman, dated 11th century BC, XXI dynasty, it is known how the ruler of Byblos made an Egyptian envoy wait for an audience for 29 days and then asked an inordinately high price for the timber that he asked to sell to Egypt. The first pharaohs of XXII dynasty Shis Honkai and Azurkanai, apparently, still for some time controlled Byblos which in this period was the largest center of northern Phoenicia. The victory steel of Shis Honk, similar to the one found in Megiddo, and statues of Shiz Honk himself and his son Azurkan, on which the Byblos kings Abival and his son Elibael left their inscriptions, were found in Byblos. The last circumstance can testify about recognition by Byblos kings of supreme authority of pharaohs. Byblos did not remain under the power of Egypt for a long time. 
After Azarkan there are no traces of submission in the city. Subordination to the invaders In the mid-8th century BC, Assyria began to dominate the region, and the king of Byblos, Shipti Baal, is listed among the rulers of Syria and Phoenicia who paid tribute to the Assyrian king Tiglath Balassar III. In 701 BC, during the campaign of the Assyrian king Sennacherib against the rebellious Syro Palestinian rulers, tribute was paid to him by the ruler of Byblos, Uri Milki. After the Persian conquest of Babylon, the Phoenician cities recognized the hegemony of the Persian king Cyrus. The extensive construction undertaken in Byblos during the Persian era testifies to the economic prosperity of the city. It can be assumed that during the tumultuous period of the collapse of Assyria and the struggle for power in West Asia, Byblos' role sharply diminished, and it may even have lost its fleet. In the calmer times of Persian rule, the revival of Byblos began, and the Byblos fleet reappeared. Still, Byblos could not regain the role it had played in the second millennium BC. When the army of Alexander the Great invaded Phoenicia in 333 BC, Byblos was among the cities that peacefully submitted to the new conqueror. After Alexander's death Byblos was first ruled by the Ptolemies, then it became part of the Seleucid power, together with the remnants of which it was annexed to Rome in 64 BC. The tyrant Kinir is known. The last ruler of Byblos was executed by the Roman general Neus Pompey. Influence In the ancient world, Byblos was a major center of trade in papyrus, which was shipped from Egypt, and rivaled the Phoenician cities of Tyre and Sidon. The Greek words Beta Beta Lambda Omicron Papyrus and Biblian Book, hence Bible, are derived from the name Byblos. In Byblos, inscriptions have been found composed in a special, presumably syllabic lineal writing, proto-biblical writing. The letter contains about 100 characters. This writing is much simpler than Akkadian cuneiform and Egyptian hieroglyphics, but it lacks word divisions, which made reading very difficult. The proto-biblical script was probably used in the 2nd millennium BC. So far, none of the proposed decipherment, Maurice Dunat, Edouard Dorm, etc., is not recognized by most linguists, decipherment is complicated by the extremely small number of inscriptions, and the forms of signs cannot be confidently correlated with any of the known systems among the writings of the ancient world. Modernity In 1918 the city was occupied by French troops, who remained there until 1943, when Lebanon gained independence. Currently, the city has about 3,000 inhabitants. There is a railroad station and a brewery. The city is one of the main tourist objects of Lebanon. Most of the residents are Maronite Catholics, the rest are mostly Shiite Muslims. The city has three representatives in the Lebanese parliament, two Maronites and one Shiite. In 1200 BC the Greeks gave this coastal area the name Phoenicia. And they also named the city Byblos, Papyrus in Greek, because it was the main center of the papyrus trade. The Greek words Byblos, papyrus, and Bible, book, come from the name Byblos. Already in the 3rd millennium BC it maintained close trade ties with Egypt. Timber was exported to Egypt from Byblos, as well as wine and olive oil, papyrus came from Egypt to Byblos in large quantities. The fact that the kings of Byblos used the Egyptian language as an official language shows how strong the Egyptian influence was here. Nowadays, on the site of ancient Byblos is the Arab city of Jebel. The layering of cultures typical of Lebanon is evident in Byblos. If you climb the tower of the local crusader fortress, you can look down on Phoenician obelisks, the Egyptian well of Isis, ancient Greek colonnade, miniature Roman theater, Persian fortress wall, Christian cathedral, Muslim neighborhoods, and mosques. The narrow strip of land, sandwiched between the Lebanon mountains to the east and the Mediterranean Sea to the west, gave the world one of the most brilliant civilizations of antiquity. The thriving cities of Tyre, Sidon, Acre, Ozov, Sarept, Airwood, Byblos, Birit, Tripoli, and just north of the rest, Ugarit, formed Phoenicia, a land that gave mankind several key inventions that shaped modern reality. 
ships capable of sailing long distances. Because of its location, Phoenicia was destined to link its fate with the sea. The country's lands were mostly scarce, so it was from the domain of Yam, the Phoenician deity of the seas and rivers, that they had to get their sustenance. At first the Phoenicians built only small fishing boats necessary for catching seafood, and later came to build powerful fighting and trading ships. According to Herodotus, it was the Phoenicians who created triremes, the basis of any ancient fleet. His data are confirmed by bas-reliefs found in Nineveh, the ancient capital of the Assyrian Empire. They depict fleets of Sidonians and Tyrians, with battering rams and three rows of oars. So the father of history wasn't lying. The ancient Greeks adopted the achievement of the Phoenicians and much later managed with their help to save their civilization from the Persians, defeating them in the Battle of Salamis. Thus, if the Phoenicians had not created ships, modern Europe would be completely different. The principles behind the design of the triremes were so successful that they outlived their creators by hundreds, even thousands of years. Roughly speaking, the Phoenician trireme in one form or another was the gold standard until the age of sail, when oars were replaced by wind power. Of course, ships were built before the Phoenicians, but it was they who gave the world ships capable of traveling significant distances across the sea. The skill of Phoenician shipbuilders is confirmed by a documented voyage around Africa, the first in history, made long before Vasco da Gama. The sons of Phoenicia, by order of the Egyptian pharaoh, to whom they were subject at that time, managed to sail the continent from east to west, which at that time was comparable to the landing of a man on the moon. The cost of the shipbuilding breakthrough was the complete disappearance of Phoenicia's main resource wealth, dense forests of Lebanese cedar. The wood was so highly valued that it was used not only inside the country, but also exported outside it. And this is the second merit of the ancient Phoenicians. International Trade In addition to the battle fleet, the Phoenicians created a merchant fleet, using it to cover the entire Mediterranean with a network of international trade routes. Before them, trade between countries was conducted neither shakily nor shakily, and with the arrival of the natives of Phoenicia, it has acquired unprecedented scale. Gradually, by trial and error, with the establishment of numerous colonies and strongholds on the open coasts, the Phoenicians mastered all of North Africa, the south and east of the Iberian Peninsula, modern Iberian, sailed to Greece, the Black Sea, India, Arabia and the semi-mythical Ophir. Merchants even reached Britain and Jutland with the Baltic, a feat for antiquity comparable in complexity to Hercules' deeds. Besides sea routes, overland caravan routes were also mastered. Having girdled almost the entire known world with their trade routes, the Phoenicians became a dominant force in trade, and their cities, particularly Sidon and Tyre, flourished, grew rich, and became a tidbit for their stronger neighbors. Because of this, Phoenicia was subjugated by one empire or another for almost its entire history. From time to time, the Phoenicians rebelled, but also quite tolerated the servile status, if foreign rulers, in exchange for tribute, did not interfere in the internal affairs of the country and its cities. So it was with Egypt, Assyria, Persia, partly Macedonian Empire, Alexander still had to sweat to conquer the unruly Tyre, and its successors, up to the Romans, who did not tolerate competitors in trade. Under the sons of Romulus, Phoenicia became part of the province of Syria and its partial independence came to an end, although the region remained a significant center of craftsmanship, which is another achievement of the ancient people. Purple and Glass Production In addition to their fame as unrivaled traders, the Phoenicians were famous for their craftsmen. In ancient times, the legendary Solomon himself hired Tyrian architects, carpenters and builders, who were considered the best in their field, to build the first temple in Jerusalem. Phoenicians produced the best luxury goods in the Middle East, metal products, fabrics of silk and wool. The latter were colored with purple, which was valued in antiquity above gold. The secret of purple dye for many years belonged exclusively to Phoenician craftsmen, which is why the country itself was named after it, Phoenicia, 
the country of purple from Greek, and to restore the lost with the fall of Constantinople in 1453, the classic recipe for dye could only chemists of the 19th century. The ancients valued purple-colored fabrics in whole states, and there was a reason for that. The dye was produced from special mollusks, a kilogram of which had to be processed to produce a measly 60 grams of dye. And to dye one kilogram of wool used about 200 grams of purple. Therefore, the production was very expensive, and the fabrics were valued very highly and were always considered a sign of wealth and high status of the owner in society. For example, only the highest magistrates and later emperors of ancient Rome were allowed to wear either fully or partially colored purple togas. The second significant commodity of Phoenicia was glass. Its invention is disputed by several regions at once, ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, Africa, some other countries of the eastern Mediterranean, but historians have not formed a unified opinion on this issue. Pliny the Elder retold a legend according to which the Phoenicians accidentally invented glass, but the reliability of this legend is doubtful. Invented glass in Phoenicia or not, but it is known that it was here for the first time began to produce transparent and multicolored products. Also Phoenicians belong to the discovery of blowing production. Producing such unique products, being inhabited by skillful artisans and traders, Phoenicia became a crossroads of many cultures. Every day in the center of trade in the eastern Mediterranean, a great deal of transactions took place, which had to be secured by appropriate contracts. This required a convenient system of records, and the Phoenicians invented it, giving mankind its greatest discovery. Alphabetic Writing The lingua franca of the ancient East was the Akkadian language. All business correspondence was conducted in it. Cuneiform was used for writing, a complex system of about 600 signs, each of which also had several meanings. In order to keep documentation in a foreign language, moreover, in such a difficult way, it was necessary to have a huge staff of specially trained scribes, the cost of whose services, including because of their long training, was very high. As the number of trade transactions increased, the use of Akkadian and cuneiform became very inconvenient, and the Phoenicians found an elegant and effective way out, they invented their own writing system. It was the first phonetic alphabet, in which one sign was assigned a single sound. There were 22 signs in total. Vowels were absent, because of what records received unusual for modern people look. For example, the name of the ancient city of Carthage, Carthadish in Phoenician, New City, would be written in the literal transfer to Cyrillic as KRTKDST. Such a script was easy to learn and could be used without the mediation of scribes. The ancient Greeks became interested in the Phoenician invention. The Helen slightly improved the Phoenician writing by adding vowels to it, thus making it more flexible, suitable for any speech. Through them, the Phoenician alphabet spread throughout Europe, partly to Asia, and further around the world. The original writing of Phoenicia became the basis for the overwhelming majority of alphabets of the world, including Slavic. That's how the desire to keep trade accounting more conveniently gave impetus to world education. Without the inventions of the Phoenicians, mass printing would hardly have been possible, which means that literacy remained a privilege for a small circle of scribes and learned men. The heyday of the Phoenicians eventually came to an end and soon, after a series of devastating conquests, they faded to the periphery of world history. The last burst of their legacy is associated with Carthage, a former colony of Phoenicia that grew into a powerful city ruler of the western Mediterranean. The Punes, descendants of the Phoenicians who inhabited it, challenged the mighty Rome at the dawn of its power and were very close to success in their struggle against it. But neither Hannibal's victories, nor the enormous wealth and powerful fleet could not break the backbone of pride and strength of the children of Romulus. As a result of the dramatic struggle Carthage, the last fragment of the former great Phoenicia, was destroyed to the ground.